Okay, so regression is kind of the core of statistics. If you've taken past statistics classes, that's kind of what you always get to. You talk about t-tests, you talk about chi-squared tests, other things, but then you end up with multiple regression um, because it's a really important and powerful tool for explaining how things work in the world and for making predictions. Um, and really all of the statistical tests that you learn about, um, like uh, t-tests and chi-squared tests, at their heart, they're really just regression. Um, and in the world of machine learning, once you get into things like um, neural networks um, and other artificial intelligence type things, all of those things really are just regression under the hood. Fancy versions of regression, but it's still the same idea. Um, and so it is kind of core to what we're we'll doing, what we're going to be doing in this class. Um, so what we want to talk about first are kind of the, the essential parts of regression. Um, you have what is called the outcome variable. You may have heard this um, called other things in other stats classes. Most likely you've heard it called a dependent variable. Um, this is what is most commonly used in social science. Um, machine learning world, you have outcome variables and explanatory variables. Um, I technically like outcome a lot better than dependent, um, mostly because I can never remember the difference between dependent and independent, and I have to slow down and try to remember which one is Y, which one is X, and it's really frustrating. Um, but for me, personally, I like thinking about outcomes and explanatory variables because that just makes more sense. You're explaining some sort of outcome. And so in this regression world, Y is the thing that you want to explain or predict. It's the outcome that you care about. Um, the X is the explanatory variable, the things that you use to explain why. Um, so we call them predictors, we call them independent variables, um, whatever you want to call these things, but it's the thing that you use to predict that outcome over there. So those are the two parts of kind of a regression model. Um, so what I want to do is quickly to give you some practice with this, with identifying what is an outcome and what is explanatory or what is dependent and what is independent, even though those get confusing for me at least, probably for you too. Um, what I want you to do is pause this video after I finish explaining, and what I want you to do is go through each of these examples of research designs, and I want you to identify the explanatory variables and identify the outcome variable, I, or identify the Y and identify the X, the thing that is being explained and the things that are being used to explain that thing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn myself off here. Um, go ahead and pause this video and take a few minutes, write down on a piece of paper, type it up on, um, on your screen somewhere, um, determine what these things are, and I will be back momentarily. So go ahead and pause the video. Okay, so I'm assuming you paused the video and you went through this. If not, do it really quick and come back. Um, so let's talk about each of these four um, research designs here and what the outcome is and what the explanatory variables are, or what the dependent variable is and the independent variables are. Um, so with the study that's examining the effect of smoking on lung cancer, um, here the outcome is lung cancer, that's our Y, and smoking is our X, it is the thing that is explaining lung cancer. So lung cancer is the dependent variable, smoking is the independent variable, this is the Y, this is the X. Um, researchers predict genocides by looking at a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the outcome variable here, or the dependent variable here, is genocide. Um, the explanatory variables, um, or the independent variables, are negative media coverage, revolutions in neighboring countries, economic growth. Um, so those are the things that we can use to predict this outcome, or the why. Um, taking more AP classes in high school improves college grades. Um, so the outcome here is college grades. That is our why. And the thing that we're using to explain college grades is AP classes. So that is our X. So this is our explanatory variable or our independent variable. College grades is our dependent variable or our outcome variable. And then finally, we have Netflix here. Netflix uses your past viewing history, the day of the week, time of the day, to guess what show you want to watch next. So the outcome here is the show that you want to watch next. The explanatory variables, the independent variables that it uses to explain the show that you're going to watch, um, is your viewing history, the time of day, and the day of the week, um, and a whole bunch of other things that they use in their fancy algorithm to guess what you're going to do. 
Um, so that's kind of how you can identify these things in the real world. Um, in the context of program evaluation, generally the outcome of the program that you're concerned about, so if there's a program designed to reduce poverty, um, to increase community engagement, um, to um, boost um, incomes among um, low-income people in your neighborhood, those are all outcomes, um, which means those are the why um, variables, um, the dependent variables. Um, so those are the, the actual outcomes that you want to get at using your program. The program itself is the explanatory variable. You're saying, does this program have an effect on the outcome? And so your program is going to be an X. It's going to be one of, of the things you use to explain the general outcome. And so that's why we care about this for program evaluation. Okay, so with regression, though, there are actually two purposes of regression. And this confuses people because, um, especially when you're in the prediction world here, this is where people will yell at you and say correlation is not causation, and you're just throwing a whole bunch of variables in a model to predict something, and there's no causal effect. And that is true. Um, in this prediction world, if you're running a predictive model, you are not interested in causal effects. The main focus in a prediction model is the outcome. Um, you're trying to forecast the future, basically. Um, and so some examples of this, Netflix trying to guess your next show, they don't care about the causal effect of the time of day on show choice. They just care about getting the closest show to what they think you want to watch. Um, predicting who will enroll in SNAP or food stamps, that's a predictive question. It's not saying what is the effect of SNAP on poverty, it's just saying who's going to get into this program. Um, back here, this researchers predict genocides. This is a predictive question. Um, this is an actual thing. The United States Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, D.C., they have a whole data science office that is dedicated to this, to predicting genocide around the world. And they have a really fancy predictive model using some fancy algorithms um, with a whole host of explanatory variables. And they just try to track how risky different countries are or how at risk different countries are for um, falling into genocide in a specific year. They're not trying to find the causal effect of economic growth on genocide or negative media coverage on genocide. They're just trying to get the most accurate guess of when genocide might happen. Um, so that's the predictive world. There's no causation here. This is just trying to guess the future using a whole bunch of explanatory factors to get the most accurate why in the future. The explanatory side of this, though, is where we do care about causation. In this world, you care about explaining the effect of one of the X's on Y. And the main focus in this world is on the X. Um, so if Netflix, their data science office, was interested in the effect of the time of day on show selection, so if they wanted to say, do people watch more sad movies after 11 p.m. on weekends, um, they can act, that's, that can be one of their X variables in their regression model, um, like late night weekend mo or weekend watching habits, yes or no. And if they can find that exact coefficient and isolate that pathway, then they'll have a causal effect of that time of day um, and that day of the week on show selection. And so the, the emphasis in that type of regression model is on the X. Um, if we look at more social science-y things, um, if you're trying to measure the effect of SNAP or food stamps on poverty reduction, here poverty reduction is your outcome, that's the why. But if you're trying to find the causal effect of SNAP on poverty reduction, then you're focusing on the X. And so in this world, what you want to do is isolate the effect of SNAP on poverty reduction. And if you can get that one coefficient that is isolated, then you can start talking about causal effects of X on Y. And so that, that's kind of the difference between these things. And so when you take normal stats classes, um, you often don't get this distinction. Instead, you're just running a whole bunch of models. You throw a ton of variables in. Um, you're trying to get the highest R, or R squared or something to show how good the model fits. Generally, if you care about model fit, you're in prediction world. You want to get the most accurate prediction, the most accurate fit of um, of your model um, so you can get the best guess of what Y is going to be. In explanation land, um, the whole goal is isolating one specific effect. And often that means you don't need the control for every tiny thing that you could think of. 
Um, we'll learn in a few weeks when we start talking about DAGs. Um, we mentioned this in the very first session, but if you can draw out the causal graph and figure out all of the different nodes and the arrows connecting to different things, that will tell you what you need to control for. And often you only need to control for three or four things, even though you might have a hundred different columns. But you don't need to worry about all those other columns because all you're worried about is isolating one pathway. Um, in prediction land, in machine learning world, they throw in as many columns as they can just to boost the performance of the model to get it to be the best prediction possible. This is where we're going to be this semester is the estimation or the explanation land, trying to get exact pathways focusing mostly on the X, not on the, the outcome. Okay, so that is kind of the difference between these two worlds of regression. So how do you do regression? Um, it's a fairly simple process, especially if you think about pictures. Um, this is kind of my, I love this stuff. I teach data visualization. I'm a very visual learner, so I'd like to think about regression as pictures and not just as numbers. Um, so if you want to run a simple regression with just two variables, some x and some y, you're trying to ex say what, or as x changes, what happens to y. Um, you plot the two, you put x on the x-axis, you put y on the y-axis. And then you draw a line that approximates that relationship between the two, um, which means you want a line that is as close to the dots as possible. Um, but you also, the whole, the whole point of doing this statistical inference stuff is we only have a sample of the data. We don't have data on every single SNAP recipient in the country. We don't have, um, if you're Netflix, you have data on every single Netflix user. That's great. That's why they can be really good at prediction. But for most of us in social science, we don't have data on every single thing. We just have a sample. And so what you want to do is you want to draw a line that would plausibly fit other future points. So you don't want to be too precise um, because you want to leave space for other people or other observations coming into your data set where it would plausibly fit. Um, once you draw that line, you want to find the mathy parts of that line, um, like the slope and the intercept. And then once you get those mathy parts, then you can interpret the math. And that is what regression coefficients are. So we'll cover each of these steps here um, using a contrived example that I just made up about the relationship between the number of cookies you eat and your total number of, or total level of happiness, or the number of happiness points that you get from eating cookies. Um, so this data set right here has 10 observations in it. These are 10 individual people um, where they, they ate some number of cookies and then they reported how happy they were um, after eating the cookies. Um, the happiness scale goes from like zero to four, I guess. I don't know. Um, the number of cookies goes from zero to 10. So if we plot this, this is what our, um, the relationship between cookies and happiness is. So if you just look at this, it does look kind of positive where if you're only eating a couple of cookies, you're kind of in a one area. As you eat more cookies, it gets higher. Um, if this were an economics class, we'd say that this is probably wrong. There's diminishing marginal utility that should be going down because you're gonna start getting sick, but we're not an econ. We're just gonna say that looks like it's going up. Um, so next step is we need to draw a line that approximates this relationship. And you can draw a whole bunch of different lines. You could do this. Um, this approximates the relationship really well. Um, this line essentially goes through every single point. It's kind of off a little bit in this world, but it hits all of the other points here. Um, the problem with this line is while it fits perfectly, um, if you add any other point, you're probably going to get it wrong. If you survey an 11th person and they eat five cookies and they report a 1.5 level of happiness, that's going to put them right here. That's probably plausible. But according to this model, they should be hitting three. Um, but they're not, and so that's wrong. And so we don't want this world here. This is actually a thing that happens. This is called curve fitting or overfitting, um, where if you're trying to do a predictive model and you get the, the prediction or the model way too close to the actual data, it's not going to handle new data very well at all. Um, so you can become less accurate. You might have a line like this, um, where it's not hitting every single point. It's kind of in between all of the points, but you do have this peak here, and then it drops down, and then it goes back up. Maybe that's plausible, um, but again, if somebody eats five cookies and reports 1.5, that seems weird, even though in real life, that's probably going to be accurate. So the best way to draw these lines, um, especially when you're working with like linear data like this, is to draw the line like this. Um, the reason this is the best line is because um, 
of one specific mathematical property. What this line does is it minimizes the error between this predictive line and each of the points. So what that means, the error is the distance between this dot and that line. So the error here for eight cookies eaten, that's really small because um, that's pretty much on the line. It's just a little bit off. The error at five cookies is pretty high. And so you can see that's, that's fairly distant. Um, what you used to have to do in like the 1700s is if you wanted to build a regression model, you would essentially draw a line and calculate the error for each of the points and figure out how off you were. And then you could draw another line that's at a different angle and calculate that error and see if it's higher or lower than your first one. And if it's lower, that's better. And so you just keep moving this line around until you hit the exact place where the error is the minimum. And that's going to be your best fit line. Um, that's miserable though, um, because as you see here, this is minimizing that distance or minimizing all of the error. But the only way we got this right is because the computer did it for us. Um, so we like doing that. Doing this by hand is going to be really awful. There's fancy math ways of doing it with like linear algebra and matrix multiplication and a whole bunch of other stuff. We don't care about that for this class. Um, you can just type LM and R and it'll do this. Um, so what this does, the whole goal is to minimize the error. Um, and so what we're left with is something called residuals. Or the, if we look at this, the y-axis here is no longer the happiness that you get. It's the distance from the line. So it just shows like this 0.8 right here, that's very close to the line. That's what we like. 0.5 is kind of far away from the line. We don't like that. But in general, if you add up all of these distances, um, that's going to be the total residual error that you get from this line. And because we did this using R, we know this is the most accurate line that we could get. Um, so this is kind of the relationship between that best fit line and then the residual errors that you have left. Um, one tiny point of mathematical cl clarification here. Um, I keep saying it's trying to minimize the total error. What it's really minimizing is minimizing the squared error. Um, that's only because uh, statisticians don't like negative numbers. Um, so like the distance here is like one away from the line. This distance is almost negative one away from the line. Um, but econ or statisticians and economists, statisticians don't like negative numbers. And so if you square negative one, negative one times negative one is one. So squaring things make things positive. So that's, that's all they're doing here when you're trying to find the least amount of error, you're trying to find the least amount of squared error, um, just so everything's positive. Um, and so what that leaves you with is something called ordinary least squares regression, um, or OLS, as we say in econometrics and in statistics. So OLS regression just means you're drawing a line that minimizes the squared distance between all of the points and the line. And that's going to give you kind of the best fit line in there. And that's basically how you do regression, except for the math part, which we'll talk about next.